stay the same as it was this morning, where we'll have five short talks all in a row. Uh, write down your questions. We'll save them for the extended general discussion that will follow um, at the end after a little coffee break. So, we will start right off. Our first speaker is Sarah Morris. She is the uh, Steinmetz, is that correct? Professor of sure. Classical Archaeology and Material Culture in the Department of Classics at UCLA. Uh, she's also associated with the Coatesman Institute of Archaeology. Um, Sarah's research interests and publication and fieldwork experiences are far too wide-ranging to enumerate here, but the point is, the reason that she's here is to talk about many of these interdisciplinary issues that have come up before, because her research and publications have spanned many disciplines, bringing in aspects of material culture, art, and text in innovative and integrative ways. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Morris. Thank you, Alex and Fotini and everyone who helped organize this conference. It's a great honor to be here. A lot of the important things were already said this morning, so I'll, I can um, cut to the chase. Um, I will address myself primarily to the disciplinary relationship with classics, which you've already heard a lot about from Kathleen, um, because of course I have been associated with departments by classics my, my entire life since I was an undergraduate. However, I think we should also save some time later in discussion for the relationship of Greek archaeology to art history. Because as, as uh, Kathleen mentioned also, I think our field is in, in grave jeopardy in departments of art history. The University of California's multiple branches have lost four, I think, out of their eight or ten ancient art historians. And unless we <coughs> put up a big profile there, we're going to lose an important presence that we have on campuses. So save that thought for later. Um, I'd like to begin with just a few remarks and some anecdotes, if you'll allow me, about sort of the structure and terminology um, of, of our discipline in academic departments and in our training system, and then also look at some examples of research. So I want to begin with an anecdote. Um, a few years ago, a UCLA grad student from the classics department was spending a year at the American School in Athens when I was there, and he asked me a question early in the fall. He said, Professor Morris? What's a philologist? <laughs> and evidently, he had heard that term for the first time when he was at the American School as students introduced or classified themselves. And I was delighted to inform him that, like Molière's Bolshevik Antillon, who'd learned with joy that he had been speaking de la Croix all his life, that he had, in fact, been speaking, been studying philology all his life. Um, but I was pleased to think that maybe he'd been in a department where we didn't use terms like that because you're a classicist no matter whether you were doing archaeology or philosophy, linguistics, etc. Um, and he did end up getting a, a degree and, um, and actually joined a department that, it, that ushered in this year a new position in classical archaeology. So I think the American School does a lot for bringing philologists to the forefront of that. Um, now, he's not the only one who's confused because, in fact, <laughs> The American Philological Association is in the process of changing its name, as you may know. Now, I happen to be a life member. It's probably like admitting that I'm a card-carrying member of the National Rifle Association in this <laughs> company. My husband refuses to join, but I am a life <laughs> member. So I don't know what it's going to be called, but I guess we're all a little confused about this term, philology. My second anecdote stems from early in my term as chair of classics at UCLA. But this was about 15 years ago, a fellow chair of a small modern European language department invited me to lunch and asked me how could her department be more like classics. And I thought, oh, what does she want to hear? Teach large undergraduate classes in translation. And in fact, I mean, that's what small European language departments have been doing. Italian cinema, the Russian novel, Holocaust studies, bring in undergraduates, get them interested, start them learning languages. So it's nice to hear that we were a role model for other endangered, I might add, humanities departments. Um, so a lot of this has, you know, has, has something to do with what we do. But I think, as I say, there is a silver lining in being a small and beleaguered field in some ways in that we are an example for others. We are, if we go back to our roots, one of the oldest interdisciplinary fields in academia, even if we're not quite as sort of old-fashioned as the many branches of Altertumswissenschaft or the sort of department that Rostovstad started at Yale. I need a numismatist, I need an epigrapher, I need a papyrologist, else we're not a classics department. But I hope that we can agree that for, um, you know, for it is a good thing, both for classics and archaeology, for us to stay together. I happen to be in that field. 
um, of thought on it. Not for the, all the usual positions, uh, that, uh, the, all the usual arguments that classics departments hire our students, they hire us. Um, they even develop, shock and awe, new positions in archaeology. I hold one, it was an additional one created by UCLA. They already had Greek and Roman art historians. Um, or, but, but I think it's rather that classics needs us. And again, it's not for the reasons that you might think, because we teach a lot of these large popular courses in athletics, mythology, Alexander the Great, right, and all those things. But because material culture, um, and it's a term, I'd like to uh, have someone explain the difference to me. I hold a chair that's called the Chair in Classical Archaeology and Material Culture. If someone can explain the difference between those two terms, nobody at UCLA seems to know, I would love to hear. But um, as, as Kathleen brought up today, material culture, and I'm just going to call it stuff for today, um, is something that in fact philologists are now more interested in using. Although I, sometimes they think when they use, cite an inscription that that's material culture. It's a text, honey, get over it. <laughs> so, um, but I'd like to keep you all to material culture and stuff. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that Kathleen won a book award, the same one that Sue and I and others won, for working on a big deposit of stuff that was excavated in one. She sat in front of those, uh, one of those Apotheki mountains. And do not be afraid of confronting stuff. We can't all run surveys and then sit around and wait for Johnny Hayes to read the Roman pottery for us. We have to engage with stuff. And it helps, I think, classics departments as well. Jack recently served as the uh, visiting lecturer, the visiting professor in Australia, and I hope you notice all the small classics departments have cases of artifacts. <laughs> Let's not ask how they got them, okay? And they're not buying them anymore. But you can legislate away a classics department if you think the classes are too small, but you can't make that stuff go away. So um, there, there are kind of interesting ways it stays with us. So um, now what about these great divides and great bridges? It was a phrase that Alex used when he invited me to can reconsider these great divides and great bridges. Um, Steve Dyson, Colin Renfrew have considered this. And when we held our Method and Theory in Mediterranean Archaeology conference um, at uh, the first Coatsen Seminar at UCLA, Colin surprised us all by expressing his profound disappointment that his landmark publication, well, he didn't mention that, but he meant the emergence of civilization, um, had, had, his work had had so little effect on Aegean prehistory. We all went, what? This is the Bible of Aegean. It's been reissued, you know, and everything like that. But he thought that we had, in fact, lost what Sue mentioned this morning, that we'd lost our comparative perspective, and that many of us are probably still worrying too much about whether LM1A floral style did begin in East or Central Creed, and the absolute date of the destruction of Knossos, that we've lost some of the, in our particularism, many people have lost the comparative edge. And I might mention that, um, that uh, Robin Osborne expressed the same disappointment at, at uh, conference at the Dutch Institute in honor of John Bentliff, again, to look at sort of long-term archaeology, um, that classical historians and archaeologists <coughs> were not engaging together. And I assume he meant that we're still worried about the Three Bar Sigma and the Mint of Alexandria Troas, and that we're not putting together economic history. Um, there are some exceptions, but he, again, he had statistics to show that, that, in a way, we're still waiting for those developments. So some of our greatest divides are not so much between disciplines, classics, text people, stuff people, but actually within um, within our own disciplines of archaeology and, and classics. So some of my mantras for helping with this, I'll just leave you with a few sort of pet points here. Cross training, required courses, so the philologists have to take archaeology. Um, I'm teaching, team teaching a seminar um, this year with Catherine Morgan, and we have students on the art, art, and, art and culture of ancient Sicily. So even if you're working on Pinder, you have to figure out how this temple was put together. And if you're an archaeologist, you've got to engage with Epicarmus. Right? And so, and that's what's, it's been working so far. So I recommend that you do a lot of that. Of course, cross appointments, you've got them in spades on this campus, on my campus, where we have a, both an institute and departments. The idea would be there would be more cross fertilization. And finally, of course, uh, structuring encounters, team taught courses. Uh, some of you are already doing this on this campus. So these are all kind of very cliched little um, sort of mantras, but I, I hope we'll um, sort of keep going this, you know, going on with this. But finally, um, I do want to move to the question of research and adding it up. As, as Steve Dyson famously said in his essay of, uh, maybe 12 years ago, is there a text in this site? How do we put all this together? And I, you know, I want to put myself under scrutiny too. How am I going to do this in my next project? Are we going to practice what we preach? Um, so I wanted to go back to what I call dendroarchaeology, not to be confused with dendrochronology, to show you this, um, remind you of this, this amazing sort of 
uh, graph that Corkman published when the <laughs> Troy excavations restarted in 1988. And notice how it used to be a very narrow kind of procedure starting with Schliemann and even earlier. And suddenly it's 1988, right? It's a new project. Look at all the specialists. How do we put that together? We, we all, some of us, whether we're practicing multivocality at a big dig site like Chateau or whether we're doing it sort of in a more uh, traditional format, they did start a new publication for publishing the results. But how do we put uh, the sort of complete site report together without appearing to suppress some of the voices? So I wanted to think about that um, and, and sort of think of all these traditional specializations that we have and how we put them together in the 21st century. And I wanted to uh, bring with a stuff example. My favorite discovery, the only thing I want to be remembered for, <laughs> I was working on a Corinthian pottery deposit, 1937, 198, old stuff, and you've heard this morning, one of the mountains of uh, Apotheke material. These things used to be called bellows nozzles, so everywhere they were found in the classical world, everybody thought that they had a metalworking site. And then I spotted the picture down below. It's from a very familiar vase, the Ricci Hydria, Kyretin Hydria with a cooking seed. And you can see what these things are actually doing. They're pot supports. Um, and um, they didn't believe me in, the, in the, either Corinth or, or Athens that this would work. They thought it would collapse. But actually, um, one of the fringe benefits is it demonstrates the early principle of the arch, which of course the Greeks did not use in monumental architecture until <laughs> the late fourth century. Because actually, you'd think lateral thrust would, would, would uh, not you know, counteract the, the weight of the pot. But anyway, the point is, then I had to find a name for it. I said, there's got to be a dirty joke about these in Aristophanes. So I just went to you know, Jeff Henderson's book. I looked up kitchen, and I found it. So, so not everything is this fun. But working on stuff can be fun. It can take you into, who knows, metallurgy, architecture, terminology, comedy. Um, I wish everything were this fun. Um, but then I wanted to move it to um, a new project <coughs> that um, UCLA, the Coatsman Institute, has launched with the 27th effort of antiquities to examine these questions about how do we put our principles you know, into practice? Is there a text in this site? What are we doing to read the past in a new way? Um, so, so far we have a collaborative study project. The area located in Pieria, you can see on that tourist map where it lies in northern Greece, and it is in fact a, um, uh, an, a, a Retrian colony, which brings us happily closer to our, our Swiss colleagues in, um, in Eubea. And for those of you who think that John and I only chase phantom Eubeans, <laughs> these are real Eubeans. <laughs> Irene Lemur is shock. But anyway, she has a student working at the site as well. So um, it's an Eretrian colony. But how do we approach this? If we did the old-fashioned way, this site, its main claim to fame is that it was destroyed by Philip II. And three years ago, the mayor put up a statue of Philip II. <laughs> it's like putting up a statue of Sherman in Atlanta. No, I don't get it. Um, but this is how to begin with the community. We began with what the community had already done. The other claim to fame is that it was at this battle that Philip II famously lost his eye. So I, this is the reconstruction we all love to hate, right, from the Prague uh, for experiment. It looks an awfully lot like Val Kilmer before the movie was made. <laughs> anyway, so the joke around there is we're looking for Philip's lost eye. Okay. Um, however, what are the other texts that we might choose? Um, uh, it's famous, this site, for being um, part of a, uh, uh, an, a, a very close arrangement with Athens. Here's one of the decree reliefs where you see Athens and Methoni, one of four decrees. Um, this, this, this place had a special relationship because of its access to inland timber. It supplied Athens with timber for the fleet and specifically a special kind of pine for the oars. Um, so we're very interested in inland resources and, and basically looking up the Aliakmon for some uh, for some um, <clears throat> things. So if Giannis Tsipopoulos, our epigrapher, all he wants to do is find the other four decrees which should be there at the main sanctuary. Do we need them? No. If we have them from Athens, they're going to say the same thing, right? <laughs> anyway, but more important is we also began with the Apotheke Mountain. We, one of the conditions of, of uh, launching a Synergasia with our colleagues, and we're very happy the American School has chosen to support us for a new field project next year under these conditions is we wanted to deal with the backlog. They had been digging as long as we had been digging in Albania. So we started on, um, as I say, on the, uh, uh, the back material. There is extremely interesting early architecture. These are archaic buildings. There may be an early stoa, one of the earliest in captivity, I guess. There's also a very important early Iron Age deposit. As I say, it is an Eretrian <coughs> colony. 
some very important early inscriptions. There was a whole conference and volume devoted to this last year. So on a different level, are we interested in the site for the early alphabet? Probably so, but not the only reason. Personally, I was excited to find that there's a Bronze Age cemetery. On the left, you see uh, a plan. All the um, tombs marked are, are actually um, cist pit graves, I should say, underneath very large Iron Age pits. But um, there are 20 or 30 of them that have survived. They have local Mycenaean pottery and imitations of it in, in the local handmade tradition. Um, as well as imports, there's gold, amber, jewelry. We, we obviously have something that is connected to Northern Europe as well. So in that vein, I went back and looked at another sort of text, Linear B. There are all these figures who seem to be men from Piweria um, in the text from Mycenae and Pylos. They could just be from any rich area in Greece, right? It just means a wealthy area. And I show in a very old-fashioned map. The northernmost orange dot is at Iokos or Volos that you heard about earlier today. Um, and, uh, but are we really dealing with an area outside of, truly outside of the latest Mycenaean periphery? It's not surprising to us, the sherds on the lower right are early Mycenaean, um, so sort of LH1 and 2 from Tironi, so it's not a surprise to us. But perhaps there's a different dimension. This led me back to a rather interesting article by Bruno Helly arguing that the kingdom of Philoctetes in the Iliad actually lies this far north. Who knows? Um, this is his map. It, and you can see just at the bottom is, is Iolkos Volos. Methoni is way up there. Um, it's rather interesting that Agamemnon is said to have cursed Methoni for not providing not so much wood for his ships, but a, a, a shipbuilding station more precisely, and condemned them to keep re rebuilding their walls forever, as I say, quoted by Strabo from Theopompus. But in fact, Methoni lies at the confluence of this great river and the sea, and indeed may have been rebuilding its walls forever because they were getting washed away. So there are many ways to do this, but that's just you know time authoring. Um, I think instead we would start today, and the landscape would be our text. We would start with the site and its environment. We began with a, 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 a GIS GPS reference map. Um, you see some early results on the upper left. There are two areas of the site, not only um, the, uh, oops, sorry, I'm just trying to use a pointer, but yeah, not only the um, classical city, as I say, personally, John and I are very grateful that Philip destroyed the site because there's no Hellenistic and Roman later pottery. I'm sorry, apologies to my colleagues who worked there. But there is a Macedonian garrison that was founded later for a very short-lived time, and that could be the subject of an intensive um, urban survey as well as geophysical work. But the real challenge, I think, is to understand its relationship to the lower Aliakma and the huge river deltas. Here's where, as I say, it's already one of the internationally protected wetlands. And our idea would be to, um, to explore the image of the site and its history in terms of its uh, local natural history. Um, for those of you who don't know, Thessaloniki is going to be landlocked by about 2050. The Thermaic Gulf has been filling in. Pella was an early Bronze Age harbor on the, um, on the shore. Neo Nicomedia was probably abandoned because of this advancing um, coastline. And so Methoni, which you see down there, just on the edge of it, um, uh, I think there's a much larger picture that's not determined by text, whether prehistoric or classical, but allows us to look at this site in, um, in its setting, its natural setting. It was probably the gateway, as I say, not only to timber upriver in the high mountains um, of the Pindus, but also and, and, um, but also to metal. And um, one thing we haven't thought about is, is salt. Were they doing what they did in medieval Europe, which is bringing salt to central areas that are far from the sea and exchanging that for resources. So, and there is, yes, there is a, a museum that's being built there. So the Apotheki question, we, we again, we did not start until we knew we had storage space. Um, this is a 3D model, okay? This is some of our new technology that we were talking about earlier of the site so far um, from its topographic outlines. And um, as I say, I didn't mean this to uh, appear right before a uh, search <coughs> paper, but I think that moves at it, moves us sort of into the climate and environmental history. That's um, our next concern. So thank you for listening, and I'll ask some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. As Sarah said, our next speaker is Sturt Manning. Sturt is Professor of Classics and the Director of Graduate Studies in Archaeology at Cornell University. Uh, he is also the director of the Malcolm and Carolyn Murray Laboratory for Aegean and Near Eastern Dendrochronology at the Cornell Free Ring Laboratory. Yes. Um, 
He's one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert, in chronological issues in Eugene and Greek history. Uh, my own experience with him has been in a very different setting in Petra and Jordan, where he's also been undertaking <coughs> dendrochronological and environmental studies. But today, we'll go back to his Aegean roots and hear from him on climate, environment, and chronology. Please welcome okay. Stuart. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank Alex and Sue and everybody else for inviting me and as every time I've in fact been to the Jalkowski Institute, making me wonder why we don't all insist on a facility like this to work at at our own universities, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, in the remaining 19 and 3 quarter minutes, I'm going to attempt to apparently talk about these three rather large topics, which one could obviously write a book or several books on each case. So this, as it, every other speaker said, is a somewhat brief, somewhat selective, and supposedly slightly sort of didactic or polemical uh, quick review of the topic and trying to sort of make a few suggestions or points for discussion. Okay, very briefly, chronology. I, I merely put up this statement from Alistair Whittle and, and, and Alice Bayless, which I think is self-explanatory, which is despite the fact that uh, one can say chronology has dominated certain aspects of Aegean and Greek archaeology for the wrong reasons, uh, no time frame obviously renders most forms of archaeological and historical study pointless as well, and the need to create a coherent time frame for our topic, which successfully avoids having conflicts between completely different methodologies, but creates a useful uniform time frame, would be a step forward, and it's something that we should work towards. And I guess I would say in the Aegean world, in Bronze Age, quite a lot of effort has gone into this, in later periods, it's not really been a topic of much interest. And the later Roman world is a nice example where actually, now, belatedly, a lot of efforts going in Northern European late Roman chronology using scientific as well as ceramic means and radically changing a number of conclusions and viewpoints. So those working in post-Bronze Age periods, which commend you and, and, and etc., you should probably pay attention to chronology as well. <laughs> Just to give one example of the sorts of things that could and should probably be routine these days, picking the site Iron Age Gordian. If you can have an archaeological context in which you've got a sequence of building remains, in which you can excavate and find samples from the structural timbers and roofing material, and then find short-lived material that was in use the last lifetime of the building, so it's destruction, and you put this all together in what's called the third radiocarbon revolution, so Bayesian chronological modeling is applied. You can come up with a coherent sequence, and that's the black blobs on the left. You can sort of see they roughly work out the coherent sequence and ask the question, the one that's blown up, so when does it get destroyed? And the standard being given an answer, oh, well, somewhere between the 10th and the 8th century or some vague number like this, you'll spot that with 95.4% confidence, you say 835 to 805 BC. So that's quite specific, in fact. That's like... 20 years. If you could do that all the way through Greek prehistory and the Greek early historical period, you would start to change the way one thinks about a number of the current questions. And this is no miraculous case, it just happens that the data has been acquired and analysed, and in many other excavations and projects, no one has done that step. It's even possible to do this at genuine historical scale, given time and effort. Cytotella Lamana is special in the sense that we have lots of historical records, but we also have a variety of organic materials which have run a series of radiocarbon dates on, and that's the little blobs you can see down there. That then enables you to say, <coughs> okay, we know it belongs to the pharaoh called Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, and we know that one of his successors after the interregnum period is Tutankhamun. So if we simply take the archaeology and ask the question the other way around, what does the radiocarbon, given the sequence of the man, tell us are the dates for Amenhotep and Tutankhamun? you can get this type of resolution in which you see a dates there of two decade type of span for Akhenaten, similar just under decade and a half for Tutankhamun, and these dates are entirely consistent with the standard um, Anglo, I guess I'd say rather than low German Egyptian historical chronology, but they're completely compatible and at a resolution that's almost better than some of the debates in Egyptian historical chronology. So with the right data, and effort and time, and of course brackets, as all our discussions so far today, and money obviously, it's possible to get historical level resolution from archaeological evidence without historical information. Okay, moving now to climate and environment. 
<laughs> so far, I would say most discussions on climate in our field have been of two types. One type is to put up a slide something like this using Peter Garnsey's book and using a Van Gogh and to basically say, oh, there are these disasters that happen and nobody had enough food and it was like the third world and everything's about subsistence crisis, so let's go and study when do we have bigger crises than normal and try and make an event of looking for the problems or disasters. So one strategy. It's not that disasters aren't relevant, but there's a lot of focus on trying to find these subsistence crises. And in the classical world, we have a whole series of books on famine and food supply and so on. The alternative approach, the civilizing and climate one, is to sort of try and find well, good and bad times, but again, extremes. You're either trying to find peak moments or you're looking for the 8.2 event where supposedly it all goes wrong and it's a bit of a disaster. So instead of that, um, I suggest what might be very profitable for our field for the next generation is to look at the other way around and say, what's the situation that's going to promote a happy, prosperous civilization? I, what circumstances promote human civilization that we study, I like Bronze Age or the classical period, rather than what are the short-term events that seem to cause problems? Now, notably, the Holocene period that we're living in, that's the bit on the extreme left of the screen, is one of the most stable and favorable periods of the last several hundred thousand years. That's a truism. If we blow it up in a bit more detail, you can see there's the odd little event, like there's the 8.2 event, but most of the rest of the period in the last several thousand years is remarkably stable for what went before. We look just at the period we've been talking about, the Bronze Age, the <coughs> late Roman period. We basically see from the beginning of the early Bronze Age through to what's called the Minoan Warm Period. It's one long, happy progression up <laughs> slightly to slightly warmer temperatures. It does all go a bit wrong at the end of the second millennium. It's not news <coughs> to anybody. I mean, Carpenter, you can cite any number of people back to the 1920s that have observed that it all went a bit wrong then. So that's a relevant factor. But what's perhaps really more relevant is then for the rest of the classical through Roman period, it's one long, incredibly stable, incredibly friendly little period to the so-called Roman Warm Period. In other words, our field studies two relatively long, very stable, very benign, very friendly periods out of the last many millennia through millions of years of human you know, evolution existence. So we are studying two very happy, favorable periods. So we should be looking at it that way rather than trying to find disasters or crises. So general patterns and the potential. Now the single biggest factor that drives what happens on Earth is the sun. This seems very obvious, but it's news to the climate community within the last 10 years that the sun is the most significant climate forcing. And if you look at literature from the 1990s through to about 2008, it's still been actively disputed as whether the sun was relevant to climate. This is in the climate literature, yet alone the normal common sense. However, it's fair to say in the last half dozen years, a number of leading figures have concluded the sun is quite important. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason it was not thought to be important enough is because a number of calculations have been done on the amount of energy put out by the sun and whether it could explain the scale of climate changes known in historical times. The answer seemed to be it couldn't. It failed usually by a factor of three or four in any of these modeling approaches. But recent work has worked along the idea that the so-called Hadley cells, which are these climate units that work in the northern and southern hemisphere, the way they interact actually creates much of the energy in the system. So you only need a small trigger effect to start something to become much larger. And with that recognition, it's been fair to get away from some of the calculations which merely went for a one-to-one -one exchange and didn't work. How can we study what the sun did? Well, for the last several hundred years, which is the sort of pink and purple ones at the bottom, you can look at records by human observation of sunspot numbers, and you get the idea. Lots of sunspots means active, therefore roughly hot sun. Very few sunspots means cold, inactive sun, things like the Maunder Minimum, which you've labelled there which is when you had the Thames in London last freezing over and so on. So cold period, little ice age, or last part of the ice age. And by studying radiocarbon and beryllium-10, you can model the number of sunspots pretty accurately. That's the graph in the blue in the back at the top. You can see it goes up when it goes down. The more the minimum comes down when you're in the little hot period. So it's possible to roughly model what the sun's doing for the last many thousands of years from these cosmic isotope re records. So if we look at this example a little bit longer, 
when we have Galileo observing lots of sunspots, we can see that the production of radiocarbons gone right down, as is beryllium. When we have known evidence that we're in a very cold period, it's done the reverse, and the sun has no sunspots at all, and we're in the middle of a little ice age period. So if we look at those sorts of records on a bigger scale, two different ways of doing it. One is from production, another one the DTSI. This is total solar irradiance, so it's a more complicated modeling than the bottom one. The graph goes up and down excitedly, but what you'll notice is that for the whole of the period of the Aegean Bronze Age, it's almost flatlining if you compare it to what goes before and afterwards. And then we have a little bit of excitement activity, and then you'll spot the Roman period is again, or broadly speaking the Roman period, another very flatlining period. In between, of course, it's rather more interesting. But the fact that the Bronze Age is this long, stable, interesting period seems to be almost predictable, knowing nothing about the Earth where you are, because this period is notable in the last 5,000 years as being the only millennial plus scale entity of such stable, benign conditions. And we can turn that into a graph like this for just the period that roughly equals the sort of late classical Hellenistic through to the late Roman period, in which you can observe, I've done the scheme here of whether the solar thing is going up, down, about the same, but from around about 3rd century BC through at least to the 2nd century AD up here, we have a very, very long stable period, these little cross-hatched ones. And these are periods when you're going to expect to see probably very productive, positive conditions for most forms of complex societies. And things start to go wrong, for example, in the late Roman period, and oddly enough, you can see that the solar record changes. One of the other major drivers is volcanism. And it was popular to study volcanism back in the 1980s, then it went out a little bit, now it's back in favor in a big way. Major volcanism around the Earth is one of the significant short-term climate forcings. Certain periods in the past had lots of major volcanism, and it tends to go with major climate change. So the Little Ice Age is associated with the last major period of volcanism around most of the Earth. Other periods, like the entire of the period from late classical through late Roman, are notable for the fact that they've got almost no major volcanic eruption known on Earth at this time. So again, it's an incredibly benign, friendly period compared to some others where we have lots of activity going on. So if you put all sorts of different climate proxies together, and you're not meant to really study this graph, you're just meant to sort of appreciate there's lots of different things going on here, ranging from <laughs> spillier bends through tree ring based information, through glacier advance, through a variety of things which are looking at riverine and lake levels and so on. Certain periods, like this entire period here from about 200 BC to about 200 and a bit AD, tend to be very much flat lines in the graphs. Therefore, the positive, reliable annual harvests are going to be similar year on year. Of course, there's little minor variations, but basically you're talking about a predictable, sustainable situation. And certain other times, so particularly, for example, the 6th to the 7th century AD, it all goes rather south. And oddly enough, this is like you know, the collapse of the late Roman world and so on. So climate doesn't explain history, but in reverse, it's going to provide context in which there are going to be either opportunities or challenges. And it seems to be an important element in our discipline that has not really been considered or taken seriously until about now. I just blow one of those up a bit so you can see what happens, for example, in the late Roman period, if you look at the Sofa La Spilia theme, it's been happily getting warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer for centuries, and then suddenly it changes within a relatively short period of decades. So this is going to be a noticeable climate change if you were around at the time. Okay, so what about high resolution climate record for the Bronze Age, the Iron Age in the Aegean our part of the world? What might be possible? Well, the last few hundred years, one can work on dendrochronology, and this is a record that I and various others, Carol Griggs in particular, at Cornell have put together using penis brutia trees from Cyprus, in which we have an instrumental record, which are the full colors you can see stretching for the last hundred years, and we have then created from tree rings alone a precipitation record back for a couple of centuries. Sadly, you can't do this yet for a couple of thousand years, so this, otherwise this doesn't reach the Greek period, yet alone the Bronze Age. But there is potential here to create real high resolution precipitation records. <coughs> and in doing so, if we could match things that have been done elsewhere, 
for example, in Central Asia, it should be possible to start to spot millennial scale records with significant multi-decade to century scale droughts and other significant climate events. But what can we do in the interim? Well, at least for the Bronze Age through to the early Iron Age, we do have one long dendrochronology in the Aegean region from Gordian, which is not absolutely dated, but is dated give or take about half a dozen years at pretty good confidence through a number of radiocarbon dates. So here it is just fitting the radiocarbon calibration curve. And even though we cannot use it in the way that we're just using those Pinus brutia trees because we don't have a continuous record and have less of them, it is possible to use stable isotope analysis, particularly carbon-13 analysis, to come up again with a precipitation record. Why precipitation? Well, in our region of the world, that's the key driving force for life. Water equals life as far as most Aegeans concerned. If you're lucky enough to live in, in northern Aegean extreme, fine, it's a bit of an exception. But for most of the Aegean, water is the key issue. And if you look at the carbon-13 record from the Gordian dendrochronology that is available even now, and this hasn't yet been done in some high resolution way really suitable, one can spot some clear trends in the data at a fairly simple modeling level. Namely, it's fairly favorable in most of the period that equals the late Minoan through sort of Mycenaean Palace period. It changes dramatically at the end of the late Bronze Age towards a drier situation, and then it improves dramatically in the 8th century BC, which is otherwise known as the Greek Renaissance or some similar frames. We can actually quantify this by studying um, the level of carbon-13 using Antarctic and Arctic ice cores, so we can actually figure out what does this mean in atmospheric terms, and we can then turn this into a so-called capital delta um, record, dries towards the bottom, and I just label a couple of the obvious features. Again, it doesn't explain why you have a new palace period in Mycenaean civilization, but you can see that the stable glacial period of the 15th, 14th, 13th centuries fits in this very favorable apparent period. It all goes wrong when it obviously changes sharply to a drier regime or arid. And then lo and behold, when it swaps back to an extremely favorable regime again, we get the 8th century and the structural transformation and acne and renaissance of coal stream and so on. So this seems to be a productive thing that should be more addressed. So when we consider what happens in the 8th century, yes, of course, we get uh, late geometric pottery, which I'm sure anybody at least of my age or older, this was all one learnt about when we did um, Greek history and archaeology of period at university. Um, we did actually radically uh, get to look at uh, the diagram that comes from Anthony's work from uh, 77, or when the inaugural, your inaugural lecture had this in the first time, I think, that it was published. Yeah, and then I but at the same time, if you look at that solar record, which is a version of what I was showing before, this happens at a time of the single biggest climate change event in terms of solar irradiance in the last 5,000 years. So the fact that you suddenly have Greek colonization all over the East Mediterranean and Central Mediterranean, the fact that you have population numbers seem to be changing dramatically, a lot happens entirely contemporaneously with a dramatic major climate change to a more positive regime, i.e. more rainfall, more reliable rainfall, and a slightly cooler, more favorable climate for cereals, etc., etc., etc. This seems to be a coincidence that is too obvious to ignore, but my best search of the literature would indicate that it's been almost entirely ignored by anybody who's written on this. Ian Morris has given it about one sentence uh, that I came across in one, one, one paper, and that's about it. So, last one, what about shorter term climate change episodes that we should think about? Most standard charts of radiocarbon dates from places, so this is Cyprus, tend to look something like this, and most of you undoubtedly conclude, why on earth does one go on at this point? It's obviously hopeless, the lines are all over the place. But if we break something like that down into site sequences and we apply the Bayesian type of chronological modeling, so this is now the site of Magi in central Cyprus, Webb and Frankel, and we start to look at the data, you discover, for example, at that site, which is the only important early prehistoric site excavated on Cyprus in a high quality way, the entire of the early Cypriot period, so early Cypriot 1 to 2, starts just after 2200 BC. Is this a coincidence? You'll see the transition from what happens before to the beginning of the early Cypriot is placed just after 2200 BC. 
if one goes to Tel Lalem in northern Syria, which one obviously doesn't at the moment, but if one were, <laughs> um, you can analyze the amazing series of radiocarbon dates that Harvey Weiss has collected from that site, and you can model the end of the sort of post-Acadian period, and you can come up with a date that you can read down the bottom there that places the end of this occupation just before 2200 BC. <coughs> So when you read something like the recent article by Jenny Webb and David Frank from the AGA, in which they're offering dates for various Cypriot periods, in fact, when you look more carefully at their own evidence, it would seem that when they just happily said, oh, the period goes from here to 2250, and then it may be 23 to 2050 to this, it isn't. There's a very specific break at around 2200, in which one phase, the Cephalia phase, finishes, and then the next whole period, the early Cypriot, doesn't start until after that. And if you look on Crete, go to Peter Warren's excavations at Myrtos, and you analyze that, the end of the site at Myrtos is very specifically just before 2200 BC, where that little orange diagram that you can see. 2200 BC line to help. What happens around 2200 BC? Well, I'm sure many of you have read at least one or more of Harvey Weiss's papers and one can't criticize the man for not publishing regularly enough to come to your attention. <laughs> Despite that, the number of papers that have talked about the 2200 event in terms of Aegean prehistory are still pretty thin on the ground. I mean, I did a little search and the answer is not very many. Webb and Frank will mention it twice for about a paragraph in their recent AGA paper when I would have thought it might have been the most significant thing about the early prehistoric period on Cyprus. But there are a lot of climate records which show some form of significant to substantive change around and just before 2200 BC. And I just, given time, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you can see. If you look at stable isotope records from crop remains, as has been done by Real et al. in 2008, you'll notice that they've wandered along happily, and around 2200, they suddenly plummet down this much more arid phase. New data that I've done with Harvey Weiss, and we've done the same carbon-13 analysis on cereals from Tel Leyland. You'll see that in the earlier part of the second millennium, sorry, second, third millennium, they're up here, and they plummet right down here to this very arid values when you get around this 2200 BC event. So this seems to be a significant short-term climate event. That's been stated before repeatedly, but it should be structuring our understanding of the period. It's not a case of just saying, oh, well, it might have relevance, but as with the example of Magi, our cultural periods are ending with this event and other periods are beginning after this event. It actually is structuring. It's, it's not just affecting, it's effecting our prehistory and our early history. And the 8th century event is exactly the same. One is clearly negative, the 2200 event. The 8th century one is entirely positive if you're living anywhere in the central or southern Aegean. So I'd like to end my climate discussion with suggesting that so far we've failed to really appreciate what's interesting in climate. It's all very well there's a drought at the end of the Late Bronze Age, and this probably has some relevance, and I don't think the end of the Late Bronze Age is a non-topic, but I think we've missed a number of other moments where opportunities and issues arise which have basic structuring properties to how we understand either the end of the third millennium and the beginning of the glacial period and the beginning of the Greek classical period, which have not been addressed yet. Thank you very much. Very much, sir. That was a lot to digest. Um, <laughs> next up, we have Michael McKinnon, who is a professor at the University of Winnipeg. Continuing with the theme of interdisciplinarity, he has degrees in biology, anthropology, and archaeology. Is that it? Yeah. And you're, you teach him classics. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Michael's held various other research appointments, not least at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens as the research professor at the Wiener Lab, uh, which is where I got to know him. Uh, the other remarkable thing about Michael is I, I think he's probably worked on more archaeological projects than any three people in this room combined. You're currently involved with seven, eight things this summer alone. Yes. So, <laughs> we'll have a lot to say I to us. I do find eight hours to sleep tonight still. <laughs> we'll have a lot to say to us, and please join me in welcoming. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, 
I've always liked the interrogative pronoun who, what, when, where, why. With them, one is never at a loss for inquiry. Today, I'd like to explore these pronouns for animal bone studies in Greek archaeology. With limited time, I obviously can't examine each in depth, but I hope to outline the breadth of topics pursuable in anticipating new directions in Greek archaeology overall. Let's start with when. Establishing when has been a major thrust of classical archaeology, developing chronologies using an array of materials. Bones tend to be secondary here, but I've never been satisfied with the quick dismissal of radiocarbon dating bones to correlate with ceramic and coin evidence. True, processing costs, the irregularity of the carbon profile, diagenetic concerns and error factors present hurdles, but none is really prohibited. Radiocarbon dating more bones may actually help refine chronologies for less statable materials like cookwares, coursewares, tiles and bricks, often abundant finds. It might also reduce the temptation to date a huge deposit of undateable materials, bones or otherwise, on the basis of a well-dated pot or coin, which themselves may be secondary to such a deposit. Recently, I examined over one ton of bones, chiefly cattle bones, from excavations of western rooms in the theater at Corinth. This massive deposit contained surprisingly few coins or fine wares. What was retrieved read 4th, 5th <coughs> century CE. The faunal assemblage was heavily skewed, with practically no cattle incisor teeth, ribs, or foot bones. Um, rather curiously, such parts dominated an earlier deposit recovered from the East Theatre, excavated in the 1980s. However, this assemblage was dated to the 2nd century CE. <laughs> then there was a smoking gun, perhaps the zooarchaeological equivalent of a pot joint. A leg bone an uh, with a unique infection in the West Theatre um, that suspiciously linked with the similar infection on foot bones and lower leg bones found in the East Theatre. Either this cow lived over 200 years <laughs> or chronologies might need a second look here. Um, in another example, this time from Deir Masuda, um, north part of Carthage, radiocarbon dates indicated late 9th century BC values older than originally expected based on the conventional chronology of uh, Greek late geometric pottery, which gave dates to the second half of the 8th century BC, uh, from which uh, explanations of the founding of Car Phoenician Carthage are based. Recognizing the repercussions of challenging or adjusting dogmatic pottery sequences, investigators went through great lengths to argue that all the bones analyzed derived from redeposited residual faunal waste. While possible, this set up a host of puzzling scenarios. Why only the bones dated older? Why things were so intermixed? Why no 8th century BC bones were found alongside the pottery? And what taphonomic factors were at play? Nevertheless, a call was made that with more radiocarbon dating, revisions to Mediterranean chronologies may be necessary. Certainly, chronology building can evolve with greater input across disciplines and material categories. Pots especially valuable ones, can be kept and curated for one's lifetime, but the beef ribs on one's plate are a single event from an animal with a relatively short life compared to many pots. The date of the meal, therefore, may be more precise and culturally meaningful than the pot, something to chew over. <laughs> Other means to extract wind from bones can further resist uh, Greek archaeology. Certainly trends associated with shifting husbandry schemes, dietary schemes, dietary changes, or introductions and extinctions of taxa offer help. Much has been written about Roman penchants for pork, imports of exotics, shifting availabilities of wild animals over time, among other issues that often play, display temporal sequencing. Underutilized are shifts in butchery practices and technology. I've noticed patterns here across Greek and Roman worlds, particularly in augmented use of saws, sharper blades, and bisected vertebrae in Roman contexts but also more slapdash procedures as well. In addition, bones offer a host of techniques or uh, techniques to establish seasonality, from refined dental aging sequences or, or refined dental aging, aging methods and correlations of age at death sequences for taxa, to examination of annual and seasonal changes in tissues using mostly enamel and dentin increments, sort of the dendrochronology equivalents in animals. Overall, these less established routes for getting dates and seasons, and I think seasons are incredibly important for the world of, you know, of antiquity, offer much potential. Where is the second category where zooarchaeology is making um, strides in Greek archaeology? 
traditional investigations of preferred ecological habitats and the implications of these for animal movements establish where animals originated and where they ended up. In other words, bones can help ascertain where forests, fields, pastures, shallow lakes, deep lakes, etc., may be, and how far animals traveled or were moved. Perhaps the, re the biggest recent push in extracting where from faunal remains comes from isotopic studies. For those unfamiliar with the concepts, elements and their stable isotopes cycle through the biosphere, driven by physical, chemical, and biological processes, however, at different rates um, due to their different atomic masses. This leads to different ratios of these substances in organisms that in turn help provide signals for varying diets, home ranges, breeding and foraging areas, and migration routes. Commonly, commonly used archaeological isotopes include carbon, which typically correlates with vegetation, nitrogen for trophic levels, um, commonly the contribu contribution of meat to one's diet, uh, strontium for geological deposits and the resulting vegetation, and oxygen for temperature, altitude, and hydrology. But by playing around with these, one is able to find places, or, or is, by, is able to place animals in different environmental settings on the basis of accumulated isotopes, thus helping to recognize outliers and imports. Moreover, comparing values within tooth enamel, which forms during the early, early years of one's life, to those in the bones, which remodels until death, help determine mobility across an animal's lifetime at one level, but seasonally as well, through correlation with dental and aging, uh, or with, through correlation with dental aging analyses. To illustrate ideas, consider the case of pasturing regimes at uh, Neolithic Turkey. Here, investigators detected from carbon in sheep and goat bones that flocks providing Chatahoyuk moved over a much more extensive territory, thus encountering more multiple isotopically distinctive plant biomasses, than did flocks from other sites in Turkey. In another example, from early Byzantine Tegelactus, <coughs> oxygen and strontium isotopes from carp bones discounted rivers and a series of local lakes as a source of those fish. <coughs> Clearly, isotopic work can help uh, clarify topics such as transhuman schemes and routes, herding mobility and strategies, feeding strategies for them, livestock, import, export, and trade, and exploitation of ecological zones. These are very powerful tools in Greek archaeology. Currently, however, efforts have focused on isotopes in human bones and their diet and mobility. Animals need more attention here. Although determining where, in a broad ecological, environmental, and habitat sense, is valuable, I would also add that where can be pursued at a smaller level, notably spatial distribution of bones within a site. Here, attention in Greek zooarchaeology is focused, largely focused upon sacrificial ritual context. Other spatial contexts can help determine the range of variability in where faunal materials are discarded, placed, or interred. Roman and Near Eastern archaeology are better situated with more studies of spatial distribution of bones, and some using GIS, and what this means for a site type, room function, rubbish disposal, be it primary or secondary or whatever, among other topics. Greek archaeology needs to catch up here. And, and don't get me started about taphonomy, mm -hmm. site formation processes that underlie and shape spatial patterns. Taphonomy is critical, but is often overly simplified, or worse yet, ignored among some classical archaeological sites. As organic remains, bones can contribute much here, since in large part, bones are the things that other organisms, be they dogs, insects, bacteria, whatever, seek out, and, that, and, and so they provide a direct link between the cultural, biological, and geological worlds in shaping post-depositional aspects. What is another interrogative pronoun worth investigating? Isotopes can help in determining what an animal consumed and dietary relationships to ecology and culture. Studies have shown that um, there are studies shown variation in carbon and nitrogen values for Roman pigs, and we need more Greek contributions here, suggesting differential feeding of those pigs, some receiving choice or vegetation or choice or vegetarian diets to impart distinct flavors in their meat. Nitrogen levels may also be affected by manuring, 
an arguably underexploited but crucial aspect in Greek archaeology. I'd like to see broader assessments of nitrogen values in herbivores, cattle, sheep, goat, deer, linking those to dietary input of pulses and legumes, which give a higher nitrogen value as well as grasses that are grown in fertilized fields, manured ones, would give a higher nitrogen value as well. We aren't there yet with resolution. Much hinges upon boosting um, samples that are tested. Dental microware, in examining scratches, pits, striations on the tooth enamel, as caused by the feeding regimes, adds another underexplored dimension to dietary reconstructions in animals. Ingestion of foodstuffs can also leave a mark on what environmental pollutants affected the worlds of antiquity. Through chemical analysis of goat bones from Sagalassos, researchers detected augmented, augmented, uh, uh, augmented levels of zinc, lead, magnesium, copper, and other heavy metals. Higher amounts from second century CE context suggest stock were kept closer to the site and thus exposed more to urban pollutants from workshops and manufacturing in the area. Lower uptake of pollutants during the fourth century CE can be explained by wider catchment areas which itself might signal more secure rural conditions. While chemical and isotopic tests help provide, uh, or clearly provide new lines of inquiry, we can also tackle what questions through more traditional means. Specifically, I'd like to call for greater attention to what parts of the animal, that is what skeletal sections, surface at sites, and what this means about production, consumption, trade, movement, and overall use of the animals and the resources. Often, in a quest to distill zooarchaeological studies to their core, what are ultimately reported are taxonomic frequencies. So what's the percentage of cattle, percentage of pigs, percentage of sheep? Less so, any variation in body parts. Was one sample basically heads and the other chiefly tails? Skeletal parts tell far more about the actual processing and use of the animals, but taphonomy here is integral again, since this influences what survives. Greek archaeology has contributed here in terms of parts, um, but largely in understanding what parts were selected for burnt sacrifice, be it the tusia, the thigh bones, the osphis, the tail, the holocaust, the complete animal. Examples of each of these are identified zooarchaeologically. Microscopic examination has even helped refine aspects such as fire temperatures, durations, fuel sources, and other practicalities in burning. Um, by Contrast, far less is known about what parts comprise non-ritual bone assemblages and assuming non-ritual exists in Greek antiquity. Specifically, <laughs> bones in household deposits, markets, tavernas, butchery shops, etc. The zoo archaeological production consumption continuum is ripe with variability and needs more attention to outline differential deposition of animal parts. Figuring out biases and patterns in skeletal parts is one avenue to pursue. Similarly, greater attention should be paid to what side of the body those materials, from which those materials derive. I've reported elsewhere a case where left side bias existed in Tusia's sacrifice to the hero Feltes at the site of Nemea. Right side biases registered in a few cases for sacrifice to Apollo at some other sites, but not always. Ultimately, what side, part, cut, or resource, or resource chosen carries with it some deeper cultural meaning, much of which might not be recorded in any other source, archaeological, literary, iconographic, or even ethnographic. Consequently, it's incumbent on us to extract and report that information to figure out what the heck is going on. This is critical among samples where side and body part um, data were not initially recorded. Allow me to make an aside here about applying new techniques and, analog and analytical approaches to older curated collections, something mentioned earlier this morning, to address current questions about the history of human-animal interaction. Such assessments should not be deemed a challenge to original results, and indeed may be uh, more common uh, where problems make it difficult to collect and study new material. Given the long excavation history in Greece, potential also surfaces in analyses of older collections merge with newly recovered material from renewed work at a site where amenable. The interrogative pronoun who encompasses concepts of ancestry and identity. Ancestry in animals is, is being reshaped through <coughs> DNA analyses. 
while origins of species and major <coughs> transformations of those species, and especially issues of domestication, dominate current DNA agendas, unlimited potential exists to investigate creation and spread of new varieties or breeds of animals as well. Classical antiquity witnessed scores of breeds, but little has been probed for Greek context so far, research favoring Roman, Roman examples with their larger empire and better documented breeding schemes and trade routes for livestock. Breeds of animals might also be explored through um, bone measurements, incorporating more ratios of dimensions, bone length, width, depth, etc. Helps provide a better calculation of morphology. I've played around with these for cattle, pigs, and sheep for Roman context, and found correlations in descriptions of livestock varieties in the ancient texts with actual sizes and shapes of those animals as determined from the zooarchaeological morphometric assessments. Moreover, I've discovered cases where specific traits, such as stockiness, leanness, height, longer legs, etc., were chosen to suit specific cultural <coughs> and environmental needs and conditions. As computerized imaging techniques develop, it's only a matter of time before our studies of bone, bone morphologies and breed variations intensify. Who is further reflected in individual patterns of bone pathology and bone development. Bone adapts to everyone's unique circumstances, which include one's environment, health, and um, activity. At the microscopic histological level, one can record individual markers in bone fiber alignment, bone replacement, and other features. And researchers, use, researchers have used these to determine which sheep walked more and which encountered tougher terrain. So think of the archaeological possibilities for determining husbandry patterns with that in your arsenal. Health is another aspect that individualizes an animal, both in specifics and etiologies of conditions, and ventures made to treat those conditions. So take this broken, displaced scapula, so shoulder bone, from a cow at Corinth, for example. It's grossly deformed and infected, but the animal lives to a ripe age. Care often reveals some emotional attachment and investment in the animal, in turn an indicator of human identity. I've long argued that animals are really an extension of us and vice versa, I might add. The more that the past appeals to our current emotions and values, the stronger I believe it resonates. Lastly comes why. A huge topic deserving far more than the minute or so I have left why questions generally involve synthesis, which inherently draws upon theory. Many people stigmatize theory, oh, oh, that's too complex for me, until they realize they use it constantly and have internalized many concepts. I feel most of the archaeological work aligns with the processual or sciencey end of the archaeological theoretical sp spectrum, due to emphases on pattern and data analysis to build explanations and interpretations not to mention ties with scientific testing. Nevertheless, in studies of complex societies, such as the ancient Greeks, processual class or post-processual or the humanistic theoretical viewpoints may be a better fit since um, we use scientific methods, taphonomy, and patterns of data to address questions of agency, diasporas, ethnicity, class, cultural choice, and so forth. Thus, zooarchaeologists often address post-processual questions but with processual methods. I suppose this may blur theoretical lines, but it also proves the importance of the discipline in examining all parts inherent in archaeological reconstruction and in advancing shared agendas and goals. To conclude, prominent archaeologist recently remarked to an impressionable, stu impressionable student in my presence, I thought we studied classical archaeology to avoid science. <laughs> <laughs> and this individual was serious, and I won't name this person. While ignorance may be bliss, it's not helpful and only serves to perpetuate boundaries and stifle communication. While some of the procedures to extract and process scientific data from archaeological sites may seem complex, they really aren't when their basic components are dissected. What can be learned from bones and scientific tests of bones adds immensely to our shared reconstructions of the past. The operative word here is shared. All manner of data contribute to our understanding of antiquity. Cultiv cultivating that ethos, I believe, serves Greek archaeology well. 
I'm probably preaching to the choir here with this message, but getting that message further afield is the next step, which can only be done in a shared, together environment. Thank you. Moving on with our next speaker. Our next speaker is Yanis Kamilaki. And Yanis is a professor of archaeology at Southampton University. Uh, he's very, uh, very his. <laughs> his uh, archaeological ethnography project at Boros, Greece, uh, which was between 2007 and 2010. And more recently, he has a new project with his co-director uh, in Mawula, um, called the Magula Archaeology and Archaeological Ethnography Project. Kutrulu Magula, sorry, <laughs> correct. Uh, which centers around the excavation of an important Middle Neolithic dense site in Greece. Of course, with 11 books and 130 articles, I'm not going to mention any, apart from his very famous nation and its ruins and archaeological ethnographies. And of course, we all know Yanis as a huge advocate for a political committed archaeological and academic pro uh, process. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here amongst uh, so many good friends. Um, when uh, the organizers contacted me, they asked me specifically to talk about politics and heritage. So what's, uh, for what's to follow, I think you should blame them, not me. Um, I could uh, speak for hours on this topic, um, obviously, but I think what you're going to hear uh, reflects my current concerns, worries, preoccupations uh, on the situation in Greece at the moment. And I think we had some sort of discussion earlier on the current broader climate of Greece and how it affects archaeology. Uh, so, uh, this is a change of tone. I'm going to start by talking briefly about some of the political uh, implications of the current crisis in terms of uh, archaeology, how archaeological knowledge is, how archaeological um, imagery is used in the current, um, current climate for uh, specific purposes and specific social actors. And then I'm going to continue by discussing briefly some of the organizational and other issues that um, we are seeing developing at the moment in Greece in terms of archaeology and talk about some of the effects. And then I'll finish on a more positive note by showing, by way of example, by using some of my own work uh, on the Kutulu projects and other projects on how we can uh, deal with some of these issues, how we can actually address some of these political agendas and political uh, concerns that the present climate throw um, on us and upon us. Mm. So, um, I've decided to start with this image here because I think it reflects very well a significant change in archaeology and antiquity, the discourse on antiquity in Greece, a change that I think it, uh, it should concern us all and worries us all. It is an imagery from the website of a neo-Nazi uh, group in Greece called the CIG, Golden Dawn, and it shows a series of photographs from which more and more in a minute, and it says here as a title, another proof for the um, unparticipable um, racial continuity of Greece. Now, when I saw this imagery, I immediately recognized them, of course, as uh, collages I have seen before and I have studied before. They belong to a famous um, interwar photographer called uh, Nellis, uh, or Elis Ujidoglu Seidari, Seidari, one of the most celebrated photographers in fact in Greece, um, and someone who became quite famous for her photography for archaeological sites. Now, these specific photos are not so well known uh, in comparison to many other of her photos, but they actually um, come from a specific time and a specific uh, contextual situation which I think is worth discussing about. Here is, for example, uh, the beginnings of her work 
in relation to that kind of collages we saw before. In the 1920s and 30s, Nelly was fascinated by what she saw as sort of some sort of physiognomic similarity between works of art from antiquity and contemporary um, especially from the countryside. So she would go about in the countryside and choose specific human figures, persons, peasants, that for her, for her eyes, resemble famous works of art. So then she would put them next to, to, to each other and disseminate this imagery, this uh, collage, as for her indication that, you know, nothing has changed, now things are, you know, more the same, but there's a sense of uh, continuity here beyond any doubt. Now, in the 1930s, especially during the, the Metaxas dictatorship, in the 1936 to 1940, um, these photos and this work became a very convenient and very apt uh, photographic, ideological, propagandistic mechanism for the Metaxas dictatorship. Because the ideological um, mentors of that regime saw in these photos a very, uh, um, a very successful way of showing that sense, their sense of racial continuity. So her imagery became very prominent within the Metaxas regime. And these images, in fact, in the ones that they were shown before, um, and all these collages became some of the most prominent features in the uh, New York 1939 exposition, where Metaxas and his regime put up a big show with many um, interesting pictures, including some archaeological finds, and all these collages to demonstrate to the outside world, to the world at large, to the American society, that sense of uh, continuity. So we are seeing now uh, in this uh, reuse, the uh, kind of redeployment of these images uh, by a fascist neo-Nazi organization to attempt to issues of racial continuity. Now, you may think that this is just a very small group of uh, natters who you know, have their own agenda and they use archaeology for their own purposes. But if you think that this is just an isolated example, you're mistaken. And I'll show in a minute how these um, ideas of racial continuity have actually acquired wider currency beyond that little group of neo-Nazis. In this case, you are seeing um, a professor of orthodontics his name is um, Papa Grigorakis. He, he, became, he became famous because of uh, facial reconstruction Dimitris. of a skull. Uh, the nickname for this um, exhibit, this find, this artifact is Mirtis. Uh, I think it's a skull from Keramikos. And he tried to, to do the, you know, the, the reconstruction, which he did. And then this became a famous exhibition which has traveled in many different museums in Greece. It was highly praised by the press and by others uh, as a very successful way to bring us face to face with the ancient <coughs> past. Yeah? We know uh, this methodology from many other uh, projects, from Philip II, from you know, other, other <coughs> situations. And this was the most recent example of that kind of facial reconstruction of an ancient skull. Well, that's all very well, you would say, although specialists may raise many issues in relation to how you you derive at these very detailed reconstructions of a face. But I want to point to another project that this uh, same person, the professor of orthodontics, actually is involved in. And he gave an interview at the Greek uh, state television station a few days ago, in fact, a few weeks ago or so. And he talked about um, his more recent project, the ongoing project, it involves comparison between um, 150 skulls given to him by the foreign ephoros from the uh, feet, Pentazos, and dating from the middle Hellenic to the classical period. And what he did then was take another 200 or so skulls from the uh, modern contemporary cemetery of Zografi in Athens and do comparison between the two samples. He announced on television that my results show, on the basis of X ray, and craniometrics that, in fact, we are seeing no difference whatsoever. We are seeing exactly the same uh, facial time based on that sample of 150 skulls from the middle of the to the and the 200 skulls of the contemporary cemetery uh, at Zografu in Athens. Um, 
He also said that this is an ongoing study. He wants to go further uh, and do more, more, more uh, study and more kinematics on this material because he wants to reconstruct the average ancient Greek and also the average modern Greek. Now, I don't know whether you have done any work on 19th century racial anthropology or if any of you are aware of the different techniques that anthropology, 19th century, racially inspired anthropology was utilizing. One of the common techniques, of course, of course, was craniometrics in a, very, in a very naive way. Another technique, famous after Galton, um, the Victorian anthropologist and scientist, was composite photography. Yeah, to take photographs of many different people, let's say, within a community, within nature, and produce the average type, the Greek, the American, the British, whatever. And this is an example of that sense of um, a kind of uh, methodology of composite photography. It was also used in <coughs> criminology to produce the type of the criminal and things like that. So in a sense, what uh, the professor of orthodontics is trying to do is to, to, do, to do something similar, to produce the average, the average ancient Greek and the average modern Greek on the basis of craniometry. So, all great stuff, as you say. Um, <laughs> let me um, show you some more examples before I kind of propose what we are seeing here as a phenomenon. I return to the, uh, some of the uh, events, some of the kind of incidences and some of the phenomena we are seeing in relation to, to, to neo-Nazism days. And this specifically is a um, photograph from a ceremony, from actually an annual ceremony they perform every year at the site of the monument at Thermopylae, Thermopylae. What they do, of course, is a gathering of their uh, activists and others, and they perform various, uh, various things, including speeches. Um, they, are, they, are, they use many references, including references from, from, uh, from uh, modern culture, including from uh, this well-known um, Hollywood film, The 300, uh, based on a cartoon by uh, Frank Miller, which has become, in fact, one of the, as I said, most celebrated filmic references that the same group uses. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to point your attention to this specific um, excerpt from one of the speeches of one of the most prominent leaders of that time, uh, at Thermopylae in July 2008. So we look forward to the moment of great counterattack walking on the Buddhist convention Kriptia, which involved the silent strikes in the darkness and quietness of the night against the city's internal enemies. Now, uh, the classes amongst you, of course, know uh, the story that here the evocation is of Sparta, the evocation is of the rite of passage known as uh, Kriptia, and of course, the uh, immediate reference is that we are going to use the same tactics. The victims in this case, the, victim, the contemporary victims, unfortunately and tragically, are not the ancient helots, but they are contemporary immigrants of um, South Asian origin, from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, um, and from other places who actually um, suffer almost daily attacks against, uh, you know, uh, from this group. Now, as you know, specialists, classicists and others, especially specialists on Sparta, I have in mind, for example, the work of Steve Hodginson and others, have actually shown time and again that what we are actually seeing here is an evocation of a construction of the myth of Sparta, where the kind of the hyper-militaristic element has been overemphasized, whereas <coughs> Scriptia has been misunderstood, although it wasn't a very pleasant practice by no means, but has been mis misconstrued uh, in such a way. Now, as you know, Sparta was also the main, one of the main references, ideological references, um, for the Third Reich. It was also for uh, Metaxas dictatorship in, uh, in the 1930s in Greece. There were, the ideal society for them was Sparta because of its militaristic and other perceived militaristic tendencies. Now, in the 40s and 50s, um, intellectuals, classes, and others would debate publicly Moses Fielding was one of them and others, debate publicly the construction of the legacy of Sparta and its ideological consequences at the time, especially after the draft. 
I think it's about time we should reopen the chapter and have more public discussions on how Sparta has been construed as a legacy because as we're seeing here, its ideological uses today are very prominent and with very dire consequences for, for many uh, people. Um, you have all these phenomena, of course, and at the same time you have also um, other ideological pronouncements by government officials, by others. I just want to bring an example by the ministry responsible for public order, uh, who uh, at the beginning of his campaign, euphemistically entitled Xenia Xenius, mm -hmm. um, which was in fact the rounding up of all people who looked for him on the basis of their color, the color of their face said that what we are seeing today in Greece, in terms of the immigration, is an invasion that hasn't ha happened in the country since the time of the Dorians. <laughs> now, the references are, as, I, as you can see, um, very disturbing and very kind of frequent. Uh, my suggestion, my kind of initial kind of um, preliminary kind of conclusion or higher hypothesis of further uh, reflection work is that for the first time since the 1930s, what we are seeing here is the transformation of the rhetoric on the Hellenism, the discourse of Hellenism. In the Nation and Children's book, I claimed that within the national discourse, the main sense of continuity was that of cultural continuity. That in the Hellenic imagination, modern Greek imagination more specifically, um, the sense of continuity did not, in fact, take racial uh, shape and form. There was no tradition of, um, you know, racial anthropology, cranial metrics, all that stuff we are seeing in other parts of Europe and other countries for the 19th century. Paparidopoulos, for example, who's a historian <coughs> who is responsible for shaping the main historical narrative about ancient Greece and its to the present uh, day, emphasized after Joyson. Um, the sense of cultural continuity, the Hellenizing power of Hellenism, the ability of Hellenism to um, acculturate, to incorporate other elements and create some sort of cultural unification. Now, if I was to write that uh, chapter or that kind of passage uh, today, I would say today that for the first time since the 30s, we are seeing the first attempt that actually um, the, the national discourse of continuity is being transformed into a racial one, into one a biological continuity. The continuity of blood and of race in the racist anthropological sense is becoming a prominent feature which acquires currency. Now, it's too early to say whether this has become the prominent feature, mm -hmm. but it is the indication that it's actually gaining currency not only amongst uh, the fascist and neo-Nazi groups. Another area, um, to shift a little bit of discussion to some other areas, uh, another kind of battleground at the moment for uh, Greek archaeology, and another kind of domain and arena where the, um, the crisis has actually expressed itself is the domain of so-called development, development in terms of generation of new big projects. Now, um, at this very moment, in the last kind of weeks or so, Greek archaeologists and others are debating one of the most um, uh, important laws to do with, um, the title of the law is Law for the Creation of a Friendly Environment for Development for Strategic and Private Investments. Now, this is a law that has caused a uh, strong reaction of archaeologists and others because it attempts in many ways to break the archaeological service as a unified service for the protection of antiquities. What it does is that within the spirit of fast track development, it tries supposedly to make it easier for people who want to construct huge hotels or other developments to gain permission to do so without having the absolute consent of the archaeological service. What form does it take? Well, it takes the form of a, of a small group of archaeologists, a different archaeological office, outside the main archaeological service, outside the ministry of the ex-ministry of culture, and into the ministry of development. 
So in a sense, what it says that if you are from Qatar and you want to 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 to, to, to construct a huge golf resort in Crete, you don't need to wait for the local archaeological service of East Crete to give you permission or cast. You go to the Ministry of Development, and the archaeologists with that ministry will give you permission. Bypassing both CAS and bypassing all you know, the archaeological service. So this is the ideology of fast track, of course, which we have seen in many other projects. Now we were talking about East Street in the morning. We say how wonderful it is that archaeological service works so well with the foreign schools, with the American school, with Stapet and all that, which is great. And here is another not so pleasant indication of what is happening in East Street. And this is the development at Cabo Sidero, at Palekestro, at the Blue. In case some of you don't know, this is a proposal by a company which is called uh, the Minon Group. Uh, um, and there are even references to some sort of uh, supposedly like historic uh, kind of imagery here. And here is a photograph we have on the top of the website. Of course, um, you know, this is how they are imagining Crete, Eastern Crete, to, to, to be able to become. Now, we are dealing here with one of the most arid archaeological <laughs> and cultural escapes in the Mediterranean the whole. And the idea is to construct a huge uh, resort, a series of uh, holiday villages, including several golf courses, uh, within that area of so rich in archaeological sites. Remember Palekestro, remember Ikanos, there are a number of other sites, as well as sites of, of natural gifts, such as the, the, palm, uh, the palm tree forest of five. Now, this initial attempt by this group has been stopped in the courts because of the reaction of local society, because of the reaction of uh, many movements in, 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 uh, in Crete um, and others. They've come back in the last year or so, the last few years, and they've come back at a specific trajectory and moment in Greek society, but they know that because of the financial crisis, it will be much easier for them to push this through. They've submitted a modified plan, it includes not three golf courses, but two or one, <laughs> and fewer, fewer holiday villages to start with. And uh, I don't know where I have a slide, yes, from uh, the next website, which says here that um, Greek government reiterates strategic importance of the Greek project. So they hope that through the fast uh fast start status, they're going to go through uh, and build this huge resort in, uh, next to Palekestri and next to Itanos. So another facet of the crisis is how whole very extremely important landscapes may be transformed um, because of these fast track developments. And we may end up doing at the end the archaeology contemporary archaeology of Greece, but it's going to be the contemporary archaeology of court courses in solar panels, mm -hmm. because that's the other developments <laughs> happening in, in Greece at the moment. Um, I want to briefly mention uh, another um, recent kind of um, battleground, which I think is more positive in many ways, it involves the construction of um, the metro in Thessaloniki, the subway in Thessaloniki, um, and involves the, the discovery of very important parts of the Byzantine Thessaloniki of uh, 12th century to 18th century, in fact, kind of major, um, main thoroughfare, the main kind of messier boss of Thessaloniki at the proposed uh, station of the Nizelu Street. And there is a big battle that went between the construction company and the archaeologists in Greece, as well as many other people, because the idea is to dismantle this whole monument. You can see the extent and the status of preservation of the archaeological, Byzantine archaeological finds in that state. The idea of CAS, the idea of Central Archaeological Council, and of the company is to dismantle the whole thing, including all this work, and reassemble it somewhere else. It is a huge kind of debate. Archaeologists uh, say and emphasize that this is not the kind of monument you can actually do that, dismantle <laughs> and reassemble. You can't do that with the, with the road. Uh, and I think there are, there are signs and indications that they're actually winning this battle. There's also international petition, and if you haven't signed, you may want to go on the website and sign that they're actually winning this battle and, and have both the station and the antiquities incorporated into the kind of planning of the station as a whole. Now, I want to um, continue and briefly finish with some of the things I've been doing and see how 
We are dealing with those issues, or some of these issues, uh, through the project I have um, started, or, um, started with the archaeological service um, in the site of Kudruluma Gula in northern Fiotida. Um, collaboration with um, Dr. Nina Kiparisi Apostolica. And I'll show you how uh, some of the things we've been discussing all day can actually find some specific um, uh, application in this case. Now, for a start, the project we decided to call from the beginning Kotruluma Gula Archaeology, Archaeological Ethnography Project. So this is not a project that actually has ethnography uh, as a sideline, but has archaeological ethnography as the main cause of this whole attempt. Um, I have developed the, uh, the whole kind of notion of archaeological ethnography uh, in this relation to the Calabria projects, which are, we did in between 2007 and 2010. Um, and this is the, the photo ethnographic project of um, Calabria, Calabria University.org, where we tried to um, not do this thing that we actually say in the morning we should do, like go and tell people, this is your past. You have to learn about this because it's important, but do it the other way. As I was saying, try and learn what people have to say to us about the connection to archaeology. Try to understand how they relate to materiality, how they relate to uh, heritage, how they relate to specific material traces of the past. So a lot of what we do involves not telling, not giving talks, but listening. Involves, in other words, a long-term ethnography in the classic sense of kind of being there with the community, hanging around, generating conversations, recording, and trying to do things. Of course, we do other activities, but these come after we have done the extensive and detailed ethnographic research for three years. Uh, two people, myself and Alessandra Gustopoulos, were doing interviews at Poros in Calabria in relation to this. And this is one of the um, publications that actually came out of our projects and are more on the way. But when we went to Kutuluma Gula in Fiotida and decided to do a commercial job for the staff, um, we thought we are digging a middle neolithic site, right? And it was this kind of asset in detail, which, as you saw from you know, the, this photo, it is a classic tell, in fact, one of the largest tells, because it's about four hectare, hectares, whereas most of the tells in Greece is about you know, two hectares. So it's quite a big, quite extensive. And then after we did the work, after we started the work, we realized that we're actually dealing with a site that is not just neolithic, but also, I'll return to this in a minute, with the Halabic. <laughs> 12th century AD. <laughs> so, um, you know, at this more or less the same level as a Neolithic house, you would find skeletons like this skeleton of a young woman which has been uh, dated to the EMS in you know, 12th century AD. We were perplexed because we thought this is you know, weird in terms of, you know, had no finds to date it conventionally, and we were confused as to what uh, what people were dealing with. And pottery, of course, of the Medieval day, we found a lot, and last year we also found this. A Tholos tomb uh, of late Bronze Age or early Iron Age uh, dates. Uh, this is another photo of it. You know, a mix in the mix of all the other finds we find the Neolithic houses, the uh, medieval burials. So um, how do we date this site? How do, can we continue going and saying we are actually doing a project on a Neolithic tell? <laughs> we're excited about this because I think for us, the later periods, all periods of these things are not in fact distractions, are not things that actually prevent us from doing the Neolithic, but things that allow us to talk about the site as a site, as a multi-temporal site, as a site of multi-temporality. And I want to emphasize the difference between multi-period and multi-temporal. We all say that multi-period sites are in fact the norm, and that's the case. But I think we have to see that as multi-temporal, not just multi-period, in the sense that multi-period implies succession, that we are dealing with different periods uh, that succeed one another. Multi-temporality implies we are dealing with coexistence. 
The way I see here is different at different periods, different moments in time coexisting side by side. When I go there and excavate, I have next to each next to, to each other Neolithic, medieval, Bronze Age, contemporary us, contemporary of us. So the challenge for us is how to engage with different temporalities that all coexist. They're all there, they're alive, they can be activated through our presence, through our archaeological um, study of it, and they all need to be understood as of equal status. And I say this as someone who spent most of the time doing prehistoric work in Bronze Age in particular, but I can't appreciate that we have to see all our sites as multi-temporal and not Bronze Age, Neolithic, Classical, or whatever. And if we had time, I could have gone on the philosophical basis of this, because I think this is an interesting phenomenon, an interesting actual idea that actually emerged in archaeology right now. Many different uh, groups of archaeology talk about time in a different way. There is a new discussion in archaeology about time. There is more discussion now of you know, getting rid of philosophical notions of linearity and moving into kind of ideas of multi-temporality. And there are philosophical references to Bergson, to Deleuze, and to others here. Now, um, as part of what we are doing this site, in addition to all other conventional, normal archaeological projects we do, including, you know, the recording of everything and sampling and whatever, and in addition to what we do in terms of ethnography, which involves talking to people uh, in the villages all the time, we wanted to make this space, the space of Kutuzumarula, a shared space of interaction and performance. And that involved not only doing the, 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 the well-known practices of site tools, of school projects, of other things on site, but also doing community events, performances that involve the local community in a direct way. We've started a project of theater and archaeology at Kutulumagula, I'm finishing in a minute, Kutulumagula, where we have collaboration with a professional actors who are also archaeologists, and they come and dig with us and get inspired during the season to write a performance, write a play, and then perform it at the end of the season uh, with the local community, and in some cases, like in this case, with the participation of our students and others and kids from the local school. So, um, if I am to um, finish, I would say that um, in just this final image and I finish. I would say that the, the big questions that you're asking me to address, uh, there are four. The one is how to deal with, with that new kind of change in the discourse and the move from cultural community to, to racial community. How we can counter that. How we can deal with uh, a situation and move from a state archaeology to a public archaeology. Um, how can we deal with the fast track developments and how can actually hyperarchaeological sites survive this onslaught of fast track development? And finally, how we can shift from chronologically defined sites to a multi temporal sites. Thank you very much. Jack has directed and co-directed archaeological projects in Greece, uh, in Kea, uh, in Pylos, and in Nemea. Uh, I would like to add a personal note. Um, I know Jack from my years in Athens, and of course, uh, Jack was a very active director, and he accomplished a lot of things, one of them being to bring the directors uh, together <laughs> in a dialogue on a more regular basis, which is something that's not very easy to do. So please welcome uh, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, Phil, and, and thanks to everyone for staying around uh, for the final uh, final act of the afternoon before our discussion. And I want to thank my colleague uh, Kathleen Lynch 
since she thanked me. But <laughs> not, not entirely for that reason, but because we have coffee uh, at Starbucks about three uh, mornings a week and talk over many of the issues together that you've heard about already. Uh, these are obviously grim times in Greece. And much of what we've been hearing uh, today has, I think, really reflected kind of unusual salad days in Greece of, of European Union funding. When we've seen over the last 20 years or so in the infusion of massive amounts of money, and however that money's been unequally distributed or how it's been determined by political motivations, the fact is that it has been an unusual chapter in Greek archaeology. Uh, I'm afraid that I really feel as if the rug's now about to be pulled out from under archaeology in a myriad of ways, already is being, uh, all in response to the ongoing European economic crisis. And I'm also afraid that thus far it remains to be seen if the responses of the Greek state to the crisis will be adequate to ensure the protection of the cultural heritage of the country, let alone promote and develop it further. But at the risk of sounding like Chicken Little, uh, and as a former director of the American School and a field archaeologist who still works in Greece, I do feel that the sky is about to fall. We shouldn't, however, I think, ignore this, and I think it's time to batten down some of the hatches. And nowhere is this more true than a reference to the topic that I chose to address you about this afternoon, that is curation. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is be positive about this, but it's hard to be positive because there's so much to be negative about. I think the juvenile, paraphrasing juvenile or something. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, try not to sound evangelical. Again, that's hard because I can't help myself. I'm going to try to focus on what we as Americans can do uh, without trying to be instructive at all uh, about what Greece or the Greek Archaeological Service should be doing. So let me begin by saying that a typical day in Athens in the director's chair at the American School begins really early in the morning. And usually the first thing that the director does is to triage his email. On any given day, that director will get requests for information about lots of excavations that have been conducted under the auspices of the American School. Uh, literally at any time since its foundation in 1881 up until the present. These may be requests for photographs, scholarly documents, legal documents, even such as contracts to determine whether a piece of land has been purchased or not and previously donated to the Greek state, or most commonly permission to study finds from some excavation or other. Many of these requests come from the Ministry of Culture itself. Others from researchers of uh, the former Ministry of Culture, so I correct myself. Others from researchers of various nationalities, still others from local cultural organizations in Greece, as well as publishers around the world. Now, since I've been back in Cincinnati, it really has been more of the same, although it's not quite so intense. Uh, we've had requests from the Ministry of Culture for images to use in developing smartphone apps and signage from Pylos, the Pylos Regional Archaeological Project, even from Ami and Marwit, pictures of notebooks from Ayuryithika, from museum displays under development, and an endless string of requests, again, from publishers to reproduce photographs and drawings. It's the sort of routine I've now become accustomed to for the past couple decades, a routine that I think would be impossible to maintain without a long-term commitment by someone to the curation of archaeological materials. And the sad fact is that that someone needs to have expert knowledge. He or she needs to know what Mar Whip or Ami mean. And he or she needs to know where to forward requests when the excavator is deceased. But it's the continuing commitment to such enterprises, to the preservation of finds and records, that really worries me about the future of Greek archaeology, at least at this moment. Each year, the 16 archaeological schools currently recognized by the former Greek Ministry of Culture sponsor several dozen field research projects in the country. The American School itself typically puts seven teams into the field, only two of them directly funded by the American <coughs> School itself, Corinth and the Agora. The others are affiliated or may be affiliated with any one of 190 member institutions that pay annual dues to the American School. Sarah's talked about one that's just starting up uh, the summer after, after this one. 
And in total, at least a million dollars, and I think I'm being really conservative here, are spent on these projects, virtually all of it deriving from private sources. Whether that's endowment income or direct annual gifts to, uh, to various universities or to the American school, any of its affiliates. The result of all this is the generation of masses of data, increasingly electronic, large numbers of artifacts, increasingly nor enormous since the 1960s, when Anglo-American excavators began to place a greater emphasis on total recovery. Bryant's made reference to this earlier. The preceding facts, I do think they are facts, that produce problems both for the foreign schools in Greece and for the Greek archaeological service, ones that are often not well understood and have as yet not been confronted really squarely. So in the remainder of my presentation, I want to outline these problems I want to call them challenges instead from now on, and suggest some possible ways that we might be able to find a path forward that is beneficial to all parties involved. I want to take one truth as self-evident. Without proper curation of data and artifacts, we're just wasting time and money, and we're wasting lots of it. So I'm dividing my presentation in three parts, curation of records in general, electronic records, and the storage of artifacts. In the past couple decades, much of it thanks to the European Union and other European agencies, truly significant sums of money have been invested in Greece's cultural heritage, but relatively little in these particular areas. Since the majority of funding has been directed toward programs to enhance archaeological sites and thus contribute to the promotion of tourism while helping local job creation. Ironically, these programs actually exacerbate the problems that here concern me, since, although they involve a great deal of archaeology, provision for storage and management of finds may not be included within them. Certainly such projects have led in many cases to already stuffed uh, storerooms being packed still more full. The finds afterward rarely published fully, when those who dug them were on short-term contracts and were archaeologists frequently early in their careers who lacked training in how to prepare publications. So let's start with the curation of paper records, notebooks, reports, administrative documents, and the like. The vast majority of such materials from excavations and surveys in Greece conducted prior to the 1990s remain undigitized. And I think that's likely to be the case for the foreseeable future. It probably should be. That, in my mind, is not really the issue. The greater problem is the condition in which the materials store and the extent of accessibility of researchers to it. I just want to mention several critical topics and briefly comment on each. So, archaeological records in general. Number one, most American projects are private affairs. I've already said that. They lack any real institutional sponsorship. By that I mean, on departure of the responsible archaeologist through death or retirement, there more often than not are really absolutely no plans in place to assume institutional responsibility for an archaeological project. This long-standing situation was made worse in the United States after the 1960s with the creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And mind you, I'm just speaking about classical archaeology. Classical archaeology made it possible for many schools without any established, established tradition in archaeology, without any real infrastructure, to conduct field work in Greece and elsewhere. And the sad result is that project records in best circumstances frequently remain in boxes or file drawers, where they're occasionally pawed through by graduate students, if there still are any in the program. Let's take Indiana. But these are, in essence, useless for scholars, and they're likely to become ever more useless as bits are removed and misplaced. Point two, archives from past archaeological projects are largely not findable by scholars, even if they're located in older, established programs in the US. Why? They're not fi findable because finding aids don't exist, finding aids that promote the discoverability of the archives. <coughs> And three, even many well-established programs do not provide a clear path between researchers and archives. By that I mean a path that a scholar can find to gain access to materials, 
even to learn what exists and where it exists. And an important exception are programs based in institutions that are associated with museums. Now I'm going to go on to electronic records in particular. One, maintenance of electronic records suffer from all the problems I've already talked about, and then some. <coughs> Internet sites have proven really valuable in dispensing information. I've had one up since you know, the mid-1990s for Pylos. But they require maintenance, and they, that's not just maintenance, but constant maintenance. <coughs> Electronic records often fall victim to the, what I'm calling the dearly departed professor syndrome. When they're out of sight, whether that's vision or sight in the field, our data may be out of mind, sitting on hard drives and servers, no longer migrated and eventually lost. Two, libraries and data archiving services do not provide global solutions. Since they are in essence, they in essence freeze our data and they provide no real expert knowledge about it. Freezing's obviously good, and it's a responsible thing to do, so long as bills are paid. Public rather than private services will probably most, be most successful in the long run. But some of us have already witnessed what happens when a private service closes its doors, something similar to when a cryogenic facility goes bankrupt and Walt Disney falls. <laughs> it's not a happy moment. <laughs> Three, there's more curation than freezing an electronic archive. This may be particularly true for Greece, where any foreign project is necessarily assumed to be conducted under the auspices of the appropriate foreign school. As such, the archaeological service of Greece may reasonably approach any foreign school for information about and access to the records of any past project. By that I mean, the projects we conduct are not projects of UCLA. They're not projects of Wellesley. They're not projects of Cincinnati. They're projects of the American school. In theory, such a system works reasonably well for archaeological schools that are part of a highly centralized state system, such as the DAI. But I say they're even in theory. But in the case of the American system, how 50 years from now is the American school going to provide archival information, let's say photographs or drawings, from an excavation that has been affiliated with it when archives only exist as a frozen bundle in a library system someplace in the United States? Yet no one would dispute the rights of Greece to have access <coughs> on an ongoing basis to the information yielded by our fieldwork. Indeed, this is a requirement of Greek law. Next, I want to turn to issues involving the curation of actual finds from excavations. Uh, again, some uncontestable points of fact. One, there is little room in any existing museum in Greece for more finds than are in them already, now, with the exception of the Thebes Museum. Lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> Two, no matter who has ultimate responsibility for the care of finds in a museum, it's unlikely that any archaeologist will understand the collection as well as those who created it or are studying it. Three, the good condition of finds from our projects is in our own interest. And it's rarely in anyone else's interest to the extent that it is in ours. Reflecting on the preceding points, I might conclude, and here I'm talking about legacy data and what it could be useful for. Uh, I might conclude that conducting an archaeological project in Greece is a little like bringing a child into the world. They never stop needing you. Even in the best of conditions, and these are rare, things like tags, bags, containers need to be replaced periodically. Nobody else is likely to do this for your finds. Conservation issues also arise with monotonous regularity. And there are the constant, again, requests from your graduate students from other people's graduate students and colleagues to re-examine, quote, your material. Now, these are big issues. All of those that I've raised, and there may be those of you who are inclined to respond that they are what we sometimes say SEP, that is, someone else's problems. <laughs> I finished with the material. I don't care what happens to it now. But to me, such a position is not only ethically questionable, but it's also not in your own self-interest, at least not in the interest of the academic program that we all care about. 
And here are my arguments. One, field projects are never completely uh, published. Michael's made this point with reference to bones. There's always much more to be learned from finds. The proof here lies in the considerable number of projects currently operating in Greece that are focusing on the reanalysis and publication of material excavated decades ago. And two, such studies provide opportunities for new generations of scholars. And even better than this, by involving, or you might say suckering, <laughs> new generations of scholars into studying legacy finds, we ensure that institutional memory of projects that we care about is preserved. And in so doing, we thus perpetuate an interest in past projects, and we simultaneously create an interest among our successors in seeing artifactual collections maintained with their context intact. In my mind, the only solutions to any of these problems lie into firm commitments from our own institutions, not individual decision making. And I strongly disagree with Ian Hodder's position, I've told him this, so my feelings aren't going to be hurt, uh, <laughs> that heritage management plans which engage local populations in the areas where we work are the answers. It's a nice idea, but in my experience, it won't work. In my experience, local interest is fickle, it's inconstant, and it's highly politicized. And even when it's not, local interest tends to be focused on the archaeological site and on museum displays, rather than on the scholarly and scientific values of collections. That's understandable when the concerns are the development of tourism. These are in the foreground. But in the end, it's not good for the majority of artifacts. So my bottom line. A, don't imagine that your colleagues or students will pay any attention to your projects when you're gone. <laughs> Altruism is a scarce commodity. They're only going to do it if they find that it profits their own careers. B, don't imagine that local politicians or cultural groups will take care of your things for you. They lack the skill, knowledge, or interest to do so. And C, don't imagine the archaeological service of Greece will manage your affairs for you. They may, but your finds also may be more of a burden to them than a blessing, even if they love them. How can they understand our labeling systems when we ourselves generally need a refresher course to remember what we did a couple of decades before? So what's the way forward? I have some suggestions. A, I think that any department with a vested interest in archaeological fieldwork needs an archivist of some sort. Someone who is familiar with records and can respond to requests for information about them. Uh, this might be controversial. Graduate students are not the answer alone. They don't have the continuity. B, departments need an acquisitions policy. They need to be clear with their faculty faculty who run projects that they sponsor, they need to be clear what will be the ultimate disposition of the records of their projects. C, any collection included in such an archive must have a finding aid. And that finding aid must be as findable as a mark record in WorldCat or through search engines, such as Google. D, projects that lack infrastructure to provide such services need to find homes elsewhere for project archives profitably, uh, preferably in nonprofit repositories. And E, and nobody's going to like this, we should set up funds to provide for the long-term maintenance of the fines we collect. This obligation should be as important as the publication of our fieldwork. To some extent, the American school, the British school, and other foreign schools in Athens can accept archives from field projects. They can. Even some of the universities in Greece can do this, uh, even for foreign projects. For example, the University of Volos uh, currently curates the archives of Willie Coulson. Using the foreign schools in this way makes a lot of sense, because these are the institutions that Greek law holds responsible for the curation of records and artifacts, essentially in perpetuity. But here's the rub. These institutions themselves are hurting for money. They, too, need increased financial supports. Their means are limited. The American school 
already performs another useful function, one that I alluded to at the beginning of my presentation. It serves as a disseminator of information about the location of archives from projects that have been conducted under its auspices. But the archivists of the American school cannot know about the existence of archives in North America unless finding aids for them are accessible. Other than in the heads and the files of the American school, there does not exist, so far as I know, any registry that can tell us where the archives from a particular field project are located and who to contact for access to them. I also want to make an appeal for another sort of archive that we need to maintain, that of institutional records. In brief, the history of archaeology, if written from published texts, is always going to be hopelessly inadequate. If, however, we're interested in deconstructing the institutions of knowledge production uh, in archaeology, the way forward must lie in the records of the men and women who have created our field. The reasons why they chose certain actions often mask much deeper intermeshed motivations and interrelationships that can only be ferreted out if we turn to primary sources. Now, not to suggest that archival sources necessarily supply any absolute truth, but they do provide multiple lines of historical inquiry that can be set against each other in a form of source criticism that engages a multivocal analysis not otherwise possible. And as an example of what I mean, I refer you to some papers that will be published next month in the first issue of Asperia for 2013, which Yanni's already made reference to. One focus there is on the American school, how it achieved and maintained a monopoly over American archaeology in Greece an achievement that has had a profound effect on the course of the development of American classical archaeology. The American School Archives make such work possible even when the archives of our own departments back in the US have been lost or intentionally thrown away. Now, in closing, I want to report the sad results of a recent half hour of casual research. I had originally written uh, what passes for research these days, and uh, my friend John Cherry talked me into cutting that. Uh, I tried to discover via Google where the archives of archaeological projects that operated under the auspices of the American school in the 1970s are today located. So what did I discover? I, Irene K. There is some information on the, uh, my own departmental website, but it's really hard to find, and there's no finding aid at all. Hollies, worse. Frankfurt Cave, ditto. Armatova in Elis, it's the same. Ami, uh-uh. Nikoria, nope. Phleus, sorry. Nemea, Good job. <laughs> Berkeley's in good shape there. They even tell you who to go to ask for additional questions. But Comos is even better. <laughs> so take a bow, Canadians. Uh, and finally, the Ohio State Theosia Project. There's some information about who to contact, but that's about it. Now, of course, I've been around since the 1960s, unfortunately. And I can make educated guesses about where missing archives may be, and I know what UMI stands for and Marwin. Or if I don't know, I probably can figure out who to ask for the information. But after all, that's not the point. It's not going to be long before direct human resource consultants are no longer available. We need to act now, I think, before it's too late. Thank you, Jack, and thank you to all of our speakers for these very rich talks. Uh, this will result in much fruitful discussion in the second part of this afternoon's uh, session. For now, we're going to have a brief coffee break. Uh, let's reconvene.